welcome to Area Diesel. Uh, today we've got a project in from Brian Block, BC Block 02 on YouTube. Um, I'm guessing that's probably how most of you came to see this video. So uh, if you've been following Brian, Brian has a 1950s vintage Heister forklift. It's got a 320 cubic inch Hercules flathead gas engine in it now and it's pretty tired so um, if you follow Brian you've seen uh, him get into a variety of different uh, scenarios and, and this is another one for his books so Brian's putting an 8.3 liter C-series Cummins in this forklift um, you've probably seen some of his videos where he has that engine um, pretty well built um, and we are participating in the fuel injection side of things so 85 horse in this machine originally and we're looking to go to 250 so Brian has sent us some stuff from his horse we're going to take a look and see if this is something that we would have the uh, opportunity to work with and if we can do something with this so be it if not we've got a pretty good hoard of stuff ourselves This is what Brian has sent us. This is a Bosch six cylinder 3000 series pump. This is a uh, early 90s vintage uh, C series, probably a 200 horse uh, injection pump. We don't know anything about it. We don't know. If it's uh, functional, I can see somebody's had the aneroid off, but it appears to be complete. So our task is to try and take this core and turn it into something that's going to uh, work for the engine Brian's putting in this forklift. So, All right, we're going to move this pump back to the fuel shop. Uh, they're going to scatter it, and we'll have a look and see if anything in here is going to be salvageable. Um, once we know what's going on inside this pump, we'll get a game plan to get something built up for Brian and we'll put this forklift back to work. So, follow along. First thing we'll do is wash the dirt off it. B blast it, solvent rinse the parts, and take it in and rebuild it with all new gaskets and seals and any parts that are worn. We're also, we've already got a little bit of rust. We can tell the pump's been sitting around a little bit. That won't hurt anything, but we'll definitely have to clean it up. But we'll definitely get rid of all the dirt. We don't want any dirt in the build-up room. Exterior dirt blown off now. We'll take it over and bead blast it and try to get it down to the aluminum. It won't hurt the metal, but it will get through all the dirt and paint. dirt paint off it mostly we'll do some final cleanup once it's apart but we'll be ready to disassemble it now Like on 
any rebuild will totally take apart literally every part of the pump, inspect it, new gasket seals and reassemble it. Control rack is stuck from setting around, so that would not that would not be good. Because that's timing. Why would that? Why do you think that's loose? And somebody's been in there. Sometimes they just—it's a taper, and they might not have. The taper might not have fit. No, I don't think anybody's been in there. It wasn't loose. It just wasn't set to the taper. spring pressure, hold the pressure on all the tappets inside the pump against the cam. We got to raise up the tappets, raise them up just a little bit more to get the pressure off the cam so the cam will come out. And then you're pinning them up or something? Yeah. And it gets underneath the tappets and actually forces them pressure off because right now the cam is tight because there's pressure on it.
notice, the height of this tappet being returned. Those two are shorter, not coming back as far. Those are probably two that's keeping this rack tight. They should all come to that height there. So then is the plunger stuck or is it the rack in the house? No, plunger is stuck. Plunger is stuck. The rack hooks all six plungers together. So if one of them's tight, the rack will be tight. Yeah. And that keeps your the governor's operating on the rack. That's what's controlling yep. your delivery. Yep. So if you'd have tried to fire this thing up, she'd have been ran away. She'd have took off on it. It wouldn't have ran on two cylinders, but the other ones would have been stuck wherever the rack's at. Whether it's in shutoff, it never would start. Anywhere else, it would run away. And can you tell what position the rack is in? Is it in? Oh uh, yeah, I can, and it is in shutoff. So that yep. she'd have never fired. Yeah, you would have never fired that. Not because I can tell the rack is extended all the way this way, which is a shutoff position. Which further it goes towards the front of the top is fuel delivery. And that could have been from sitting around, or that could have been the reason that pump come off whatever it was on to begin with. And we don't know that. Yeah. I think from experience it's from sitting around. Now, do you think the plunger will be Junk? Sal salvageable? Yes. It'll be okay. That will tell us if it was a failure or if it's been sitting around. Yeah. If the plunger isn't scarred up, it's from sitting around. If it's scarred up, it was an operational failure. plunger the barrel still in the pump and they're, they're yep. class fit so you cannot mix these up right there. Correct. We'll have to go to other methods to get those two out. Plunger return springs, that's what's keeping tappet pressure on the cam. Class fit part have to be kept together, not necessarily in a certain order, but. And what is the delivery still, valve? This is a delivery valve, yep. Okay, two and three are stuck. Special tool. <laughs> Just enough pressure to get them out. So kept in order. Two, three. Segments, control segments. don't have to be kept in order. Once got past the two stuck plunges, rack totally free. This direction shut off. That's max fuel. What it's doing is turning this plunger determines the effective stroke. No stroke. Short effective stroke, long effective stroke. So shut off, idle, stream full of load. Washers, 
we're not going to reuse, and we actually won't even use lock washers when we rebuild it. Bosch did away with them 20 years ago. They would break. A portion of the lock washer would slip out. The plans would come loose, break. So the lock washers are no longer used. Torque them to specs. There's a shim. That controls cylinder, individual cylinder timing. The higher the flange is, the longer it takes the plunger to get to the delivery position. It retards the timing. The shorter it is, the quicker it delivers fuel, it advances timing. Each one has to be within a degree of each other. One, five, three, six, two, four. Shims are all numbered. 145 has to match the shim on that cylinder. And 99 percent of the time they do match. If you get a mismatch set, it'll torque the plan sideways, cause that barrel to be tight. So we'll keep one reference, 145, for number one. The rest of them we can throw in the pan. We'll do that on the test stand. Everything's in reference to number one. So that's your baseline. Timing mark is set with number one. Five will be next in firing order. One, five, three, six, two, four, five. Has to be 60 degrees pump timing after number one. If it's 61 past, we'll go to a smaller shim. So it's 60 degrees past one. Extremely important not to damage any surface of that plunger. It's a class fit. Any damage to that plunger would make that tight, restrict our movement, and cause running issues. So be very careful with the plungers. pin keeps this rack in a 21 millimeter movement. Okay, ready to solvent rinse, face all our houses off, pressure wash, clean everything up for the build up room. Alright, so now we're back in the fuel shop with Gary. Um, we're about I'm going to say two hours into this project uh, and we've got this pump totally scattered. Uh, what we learned was the rack was stuck. It was stuck in the totally off position. We had uh, barrel and plunger two and three were seized. They don't appear to be damaged. Um, so probably from sitting around is what Gary's, Gary's thought is. Um, Gary, very, any... very common with fuel nowadays that you can't let them sit around for even a month or two or they have a chance of the ethanol in it or whatever might be in the diesel fuel will cause them to get tight, varnish up. So uh, overall condition? Overall condition is very good. Very buildable. All new gaskets and seals, a few normal rebuild parts. Have to do a little bit of work on the end of the camshaft. Again, it was sticking outside the pump when it sat around and got rusty, but didn't damage the metal, so we'll just polish that up and all the loads are good, bearings are good, we'll rebuild the pump. 
All right, so next steps. What do we do? What do we do from here? Next step, take it over, solvent rinse, all the hard parts. Use our sand off wheel, face off wheel. Face off all the flat surfaces for gaskets. Pressure wash again and again until there's no dirt oil, anything left. Go to the build up room. show you the recycle property of this tank. Before we use the, the solvent, again this solvent is very well enough clean enough to be used. But that's the actual condition of the solvent and it's a bit dirty. All I have to do is hit a recycle button on the machine. The whole process probably takes two to three hours to recycle it. It actually boils the solvent, condenses the solvent, all the oil and dirt settle to the bottom, go to a holding tank, one thing that'll be coming out of here next will be clean recycled solvent.
bring it up process. Next we'll head to the build up room. All the dirt and oil should be kept back in the tear down area. some grease in my housing to help the o-rings so they don't get cut on the symbol in the pump. Okay, I'm going to install the control rack. Links the governor to the pump elements. To operate correctly when it's all said and done, this control rack linking the governor to the pump has to be completely free. Any kind of stiction, any kind of holdups, governor's going to want to throw it into a fueling position. It's not going to want to go. It's going to want to stick in the fueling position, not want to come back when the governor wants to pull it back. And it's going to have a constant back and forth surge. Hopefully it'll stay free enough to return on its own power with all parts installed. Barrels and plungers are so finely produced within microns. If you get any kind of wear on these at all, you'll start losing power first and then eventually your unit won't even start. Every one of these will get a shim so that they are exactly 60 degrees apart in their firing order. Start with a 145, which is the number that it came apart with on number one. Good starting point. They have to be matched exactly. Okay, this unit here, we're using new flange bushings. The old ones, rusty. Put an o-ring on that it's not going to seal so they are getting replaced and keep these in order going to be number one the barrel and plunger first the delivery valve second delivery valve gasket spring filler piece cylinder has a steel baffle on it for whenever injection is done the high pressure escapes there after the cylinder has been done pumping so it doesn't erode through the housing gets a steel baffle ring special tool again new snap ring again new seals particular unit here, the top o-ring keeps fuel from escaping to the exterior. Two bottom o-rings keep the fuel from getting into the engine oil. From here on up is all fuel. 
there down is engine oil. Grease to keep it from getting cut. Locating pin, control rack side. So now I'll just set it in the housing and on to the rest. Okay, we're down to the number six here. Same thing. Quarter valve. Gasket. Spring. Just a note about the baffle ring that I'm telling you about. You want the baffle ring with the holes down. If you flip it upside down, you line your baffle ring holes up with your spill port holes and negate the efficiency of that product. Or the spill from fuel injection will erode right through the side of aluminum. You also don't want to pack between your O-rings with grease. You just want to use enough grease to barely lubricate them. If you put too much grease in there, you stick it in the housing. Pressure can build up in that area and seize a barrel and plunger. Not good. The amount, adequate amount of grease, they pop right in without cutting the O-rings. Each one of these barrels have oblong slots on them. That's going to be used to finely tune and balance all six cylinders together. So for now, I'm going to try to center my studs in those holes. Keep these barrel and plungers from seizing. I'll be doing that a lot. Okay, top end complete for now. This is the same control rack out of the pump. Six notches, six control sleeves. Each one of these goes on top of a plunger. So when one plunger is rotated, All six of them are rotated the same amount. Sometimes you'll get wear in the slots, which guide the plungers, in which case the plungers don't necessarily move with the control segment, and that's unequal delivery. Again, this is an upside down barrel and plunger segment, driving on the barrel. Controlling the plunger. Okay, visually I can see all six of them moving together. Still have a free rack. Plungers have an identifying mark for the direction they go in. Rollers, again lubrication, 
locating pin. Cam is not going to go in with the tappets sticking down that far on their plunger return springs. A little special tool. This we can compress the springs with. More special tools to hold them in position with the spring compressed. Have to locate the plunger with the segment. Each one of these as we put them in, we're going to make sure that rack is free. Same. All six plungers in and still free, so we're ready to install the cam. Two important portions about the cam. One of them is going to be final in play. But another thing we have to worry about is the protrusion of the taper outside the front of the pump. First thing we're going to do is position the rear cam. Done by a shim inside the governor cover. This is going to result in the protrusion. If we had a thicker shim, move the cam bearing forward, have more protrusion. Thinner shim, less protrusion. First thing I'm going to do is move this bearing back in its race so that when I tighten the cover to the housing, it will set this bearing the distance that this shim is asking for. Area diesel special tool. All this is doing is moving the bearing back in the housing a little bit. Camshaft should turn with no in play up to 4,000, but closer to nothing. 
So in play is correct. Now we'll check protrusion. Have a taper on the end of the cam, a taper tool. Standard calipers. Measure my distance. Should be 13 and a half. And I am at 1348, so that is very, very good protrusion. Too much protrusion, the driving gear could be stuck forward in the engine with interference. With protrusion set, in place set, we'll remove the tappet tool. Spin the cam anymore. Pressure from tap it and springs is on it. The rack should still be free. We're still good. Attach our bottom cover. Install is my shutoff shaft. It's hard to get in there if the weights are in installed. I can tell I have a tapered pin again. Goes in further from one side than from the other. I need my shutoff on this side of the pump. So I'm going to have to move my lever to the opposite side. shaft is also important. Thicker one or a thinner one I'll use. That's my thinner spacer. Has the correct end play. Still free. With the governor linkage installed, this will work the control rack from the forward position, which is a running position, to a shutoff position. Next we'll install our weights. The 8.3 we're putting this in, being in a forklift. We're installing an automotive style governor versus an agricultural governor. Agricultural governor has a different style of flyweights. It always has a governor at all ranges of speed. Mid speed has a governor. This pump is set up, has a governor at idle, a high speed cutoff. The middle range of this engine is ran with a foot feed for the throttle on the forklift. If it starts getting under load, you give it some more throttle. Load comes off, you let off the throttle. Basically they have the idle springs pack initially. Then the second spring pack is much heavier. So the first portion it runs on the idle springs. High speed it runs under full load springs. It's also set up with a fuel plate. Two examples. Governor action, flyweight action. The faster this governor goes, the higher this rod lifts up and down inside here. 
as it moves up and down, it will track along the curvature of this fuel plate. So at different speeds, at low speed, it'll be down here, allowing the rack to go forward further. The faster the engine goes, mid-range, it can only go that far forward. This fuel plate here is set up for a top end. It will go extremely far. This one has <laughs> several ramps. This is the one we're going to use. Again, it's all up to the test plan and the governor setup. Built with rubber cushions to isolate the vibration of the camshaft and the tappets away from the weights. Once the unit's calibrated and we set our timing, this extension is going to line up with the timing window. The beginning of injection on number one, we will determine the timing this engine will be set at. We will tighten this drive down at that particular point. I have a range with slots on it. tool installed on the front, I'll center my timing window, tighten the drive and the weights down, and I'll still have a little bit of range of movement for fine-tuning my timing to whatever I want to set it to. Lock tight. Fly weights on a dry taper. Okay, we got another very special washer. When I would attach these fly weights, I want them to be on their rubber cushions. If I have too thin of a washer, this set of weights will get locked to the camshaft, and vibration could very easily loosen this nut. Fly weights can come loose, no governor control, bad problem. So after I torque this in, I want to make sure that I still have a rubber cushion on my weights. Weights are installed on the cam. We still have some internal governor to build. You gotta rotate this sideways. This rod is going to transfer motion from my fly weights to my governor arm. It's adjustable and has to be set in relation to the pump. Extend that through the weights in the relaxed position. 
a go no go gauge. I know my adjustments correct. I'll reclip my pin. We'll finalize the internal governor parts and then we'll proceed to the cover. Assemble the governor cover. Already have new seal installed. New plug in the back. Of course it's been cleaned up and faced off in the back with everything else to begin with. We're going to install a different throttle shaft that will accompany our throttle lever. Our return spring set up. One thing we're going to have to do Okay, this is more just internal RQV governor parts. Guide blocks is attached to the throttle lever, throttle shaft, using tapered pins. So the first thing I have to do, two ot reamer, has the same taper as my pins. We're going to clean out the pin holes. Starting with the first one. Pre install the pin. Taper the second one to match. Should be protruding the same, they are. Okay, that's ready for installation. Light amount of grease. Two shims, which will keep our throttle shaft with the right amount of in play. Freedom of movement, no acceptance of men play. You can see a little bit of the operation of this. It starts out in the back, ends up coming further forward. Idle position, full load position. Also changes my ratio of flyweight movement to rack movement. Further this sliding block is up in this track. The less relative motion it has, the further down it has, it goes, the more relative motion it has. All qualities of the governor. Different governors have different S plates. Different governors have different fuel plates. Next trick, getting this cover on that assembly. Get a new gasket. Have this pre-assembled. I know from experience, I'm going to start with that down. I have to get this sliding piston inside this track. First portion is relatively easy. Next step, I have to get this cross pin through another portion of the top. governor, plug, cover, tell you about the fuel plate. 
Now it's the top of the governor. The further forward this fuel plate is adjusted, the more fuel it will put out on the engine. The further back, the less amount of fuel. And again, everything else is controlled with the ramp hitting the ramps on my plate. Okay, we're going to leave this cover off as we have an adjustment or two inside here that we're going to have to make on the test stand. We have one more assembly we're going to make before we get in on the test stand. Our aneroid setup is going to cut fuel delivery back using the same fuel portions inside the governor. Will be dependent on the amount of boost the turbocharger is making at the time. With no turbo boost, fuel will be slid backwards. The more turbo boost we get, we'll get full fuel, fuel adjusted fuel. Our build is complete. Next step will be moving to the test room and calibration. Had our pump completely rebuilt with the gaskets and seals. Now we're on our test stand. We're going to have to make our calibration adjustments to it. We're going to cover three or four basic steps. One of them is going to be timing. <clears throat> we have to set the pump with a timing pin and a timing mark so it can be timed to the motor. We're looking at a 12 to 13 degrees before top dead center running on this one. So, first thing I'm going to do is set Number one, in relation to my timing pin, I'm going to make sure that in my firing order, which is 1, 5, 3, 6, 2, 4, they're 60 degrees apart. Once we get the timing set, all six cylinders balanced there, we'll set a timing pin for 13 degrees. Then we'll go on to the fuel portion of it. First thing we'll do will be the phase timing. Break my bleeders on my injectors loose. Start my high pressure. This will actually take my delivery valves off their seats against their springs. I'll get fuel flow out of my injectors. As each plunger comes up, as soon as it covers the, the filling ports for the barrel, fuel will stop coming out of the valve here. That will indicate beginning of injection. Base timing has to be done. In a mid-rack position, from 10 to 12 millimeters of rack, which will 
indicated on my left, dial indicator. And 12 degrees. If I was to time this in the full start position, I would be in a retard for start position, but my timing and my timing pin would be off. I have fuel coming out of all six of my injectors. Pay attention to number one. As soon as the flow stops, that indicates the filling ports are closed. The only place that fuel can go out now is being pumped out through my injector. I'm going to set my dial indicator. A degree wheel, I should say, at zero. That indicates number one to be in check. Next time I check, five. See if it's at the 60 degree mark. And as soon as it stops flowing and starts dripping, I'm right at 63, so number 5 is good. 3 is next. Three is stopping a degree earlier than 5 is one bit. So I'm going to add a taller shift to that to bring that to my 120 degree mark. This one has 140 stamped on it, so I'll go to a 150. I'm right at my one so I'll go to a 6. My specs, six and a half degrees past. Install my timing pin, adjust it. When he puts this on the motor, the timing pin in, it will have already fired six and a half degrees pump timing, which is half of engine timing, which will relate to 13 degrees before top dead center for the engine. Okay, if I loosen in my window here. That will slide up and down along with my camshaft. So I dial in my six and a half. Remove the pin. Keep from bending the arm. That is the timing position. This is the running position where the pin is not engaged with the pin. Okay, now we're going to set our fuel. Balance it cylinder to cylinder using our drop tubes. let all my foaming settle down to get a true indication of my cc's of delivery. So I'm going to double my readings on there to get what I write on my spec sheet. I'm looking for 255 cc's. So 120 would represent 240. 125 represents 250. 130 registers 260. We're setting this one at 255. Record my delivery for future reference. RP and check. This will represent a torque backup check.
it and it went down to zero. This is going to indicate my starting fuel. Check my rack. I need 21 millimeters of travel, which is my full rack travel. I'll see at what RPM it goes from my Android stop, which is 10 millimeters, to full light travel, which is 21. I need it to be around 350 RPM stop. Gradually increasing my speed, I can tell that it goes out of my front position before 300, which is in my stack. If I go down to my starting speed of 100 RPM to pop. Let's see if I have enough fuel to start my motor. Just have to take it off the stand now, drain all the fluids out of it, and we'll do some of the buttoning up finish work. And I'm back in my build up room. And the only thing I have left to do in here, short of capping it up, I have to make sure these are all torqued in. If they aren't torqued in, they can back off, come loose, break the studs. shaft around till my timing pointer comes around. Engage it with a timing pin. The pin engage, if this engine is installed in this position, it'll be timed for 13 degrees before top dead center on the engine. I'll cap my drive hub loose so I don't break my pin by knocking my drive hub off. I'll now reinstall my rack cap. This is a test fitting. I'll install a bracket on my governor, bushings for my return spring, and a lever for on the engine. Yeah, he didn't want a solenoid. Yeah. Tyler called him and asked him about that. He's going to run a shut off here, so he'll just have to design that himself. Yeah. And we'll put this lever on it. So he can run it here if he wants to, down here if he wants to. Yeah. And with that lever I can still put this on it, which is basically a return spring. This bracket here has a hole there to engage the return spring. This Actually, can go to here for a remote. Like a cable in it. Well, like a cement truck, for example, runs half throttle for the PTO, and the it's got a secondary speed adjustment, remote speed adjustment, like a knob or whatever. So the hydraulics will run while you're yeah. sitting in the yeah. parking spot. You might not want that. That's fine, but it does have a place for a cable. Yeah. That attachment if he wants to rig it up himself. That's all going to be up to him. It's going to be up to him how to hook his throttle yeah. into a system. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. But it will have a return for idle and it will have, let's say, that on it. He don't even have to use that if he doesn't want to. Perfect. 